I'm going to try not to look at Brian and Kara Twombly this morning. So if you see me sort of scanning the audience and then leaping over this section and You know that Brian came here to get, he came to get training, he came to build some relationships and have other people praying for him and investing in the work in Papua New Guinea, came to spend time with Jeremy Lehman and learn the ropes of what must happen in Medang, came to spend time with the leadership of Finisterre uh, to really set in motion some long-term goals for the needs of the people in the Finisterre Mountains. And Brian just couldn't help it. He, instead of getting and getting and getting, just gave and gave and gave. And 11 weeks have flown by. Brian was sharing me this week that uh, one of his sidebar goals, maybe not the main goal, but a sidebar goal of coming to Tempe before heading to Papua New Guinea was to sort of have a practice run at saying goodbye to his beloved home church in Stewart, Florida. Where Brian grew, where Brian was equipped and trained, ordained as an elder, and serving faithfully in the ministries in that church. So Papua New Guinea is a long way from Florida. Maybe if we just sort of test drive going to Tempe for a little while, we can practice saying goodbye. It backfired <laughs> because now there are two families to which their lives have been inextricably linked. And uh, just love the way mutual love happens in the body of Christ. I love the way investment for ministry gets us invested in each other's lives. And so, Brian, you've made it not just difficult for yourself to leave Tempe to go back to Florida on your way to Papua New Guinea, but you've made it hard on all of us. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Where do you find a Brian Twombly? Where do you, where do you get one of those? For that matter, where do you find an elder for church ministry? Where, where do you get pastors? Where do you get qualified, equipped men ready to take the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament church to places where they are not yet known or to faithfully shepherd in local churches? Where do you find such men? Where do you find an Omri Miles or a Denny Pagel or an Eric Martin, a Jacob Handla, a Matt Kelso, where do you find a Tom Angstead or a Josh Kelso to send up the street to plant a new church? And today we're going to present to you a new elder intern. You may be newer to Grace Bible Church, and so we want to give you a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at how we go about training shepherds, growing shepherds, cultivating shepherds. How does one become an elder at Grace Bible Church? So this is something of an unusual sermon. We're taking a break from our verse-by-verse -verse exposition of John chapter 10. And we're going to take a little time this morning to talk about installing shepherds in the local church, training missionaries, training pastors, equipping elders. Do elders grow on trees? What about the stork? Does some bird fly from far off places and drop them off at the doorstep? Is there a pastor store out there somewhere? Can you get them on Amazon.com? Does someone just raise his hand and say, hey, I'm an elder, and self-appoint to the role and the task? Your answer might be, wait, I, I know the answer to that. It's seminary. You, you get pastors and elders from seminaries, and you call the seminary office up and you say, hey, I need one, and they send you one. Yes, that, that happens. It, it has happened. But still, those men who went to seminary came from somewhere. They weren't born pastors. They weren't born thinking about eldering. There was a process involved. And is seminary, uh, a seminary particularly that is, that is unconnected and unaccountable to a local church... Is such a school the best institution to identify, scrutinize, cultivate, and equip men to serve and lead local churches? I would contend to you that the answer to that is no. Local churches are the best places to find, equip, train, cultivate, 
intern, residency, pastors. This is where training ought to happen. I'm thankful that the seminary I went to actually sits physically on the campus of a faithful church. And I'm very grateful that this church has taken such a serious and sober approach to training men. All of you are involved in the task of training men as we are a campus of the Expositor Seminary, which is made up of 11 connected churches whose pastors are the faculty training another generation of missionaries and church planters and pastors and elders. At bottom, Acts 20.28 makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is the one who makes overseers to shepherd the church of God. And just by way of reminder, the, the terms overseer, shepherd, elder, pastor, those are four titles, descriptive titles for the same office. They come with the same qualifications, the same responsibilities. And while there are varieties of gifts and uh, varieties of responsibilities in a local church, that elder, shepherd, overseer, pastor title all describes the same office in the New Testament. The biblical means that God uses, whereby the Holy Spirit makes one an overseer, uh, whereby one is cultivated and qualified for leadership in the church, is the local church, biblically speaking. Therefore, local churches must be about the business of raising up elders, pastors, missionaries. So this morning, we're talking together a little bit about training shepherds in the church, finding shepherds, growing shepherds, developing shepherds. How do we go about the task of raising up the next generation of pastors in our church and from our church? How do we collectively as a church think about faithfully passing on the baton so that the truth survives and thrives beyond the ministries and lifetimes of the men who currently serve as leaders in this church? And then how do we see the gospel and the truth of God's word go beyond the walls of this church? How will the church be multiplied to the ends of the earth? And what I want to do this morning is take you to two texts. This is a two passage sermon. We'll be this morning in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission text, and we'll be in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And we're going to attempt by these two passages to answer the question, where do shepherds for the church come from? And the first answer to that question is simply a culture of discipleship, a culture of discipleship. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. This, of course, is that text, the Great Commission. We heard from Ryan Mitchell preach this text a number of weeks ago. And we want to highlight some details here in Matthew 28, specifically verses 19 and 20. Look down at your Bibles and read along with me. Jesus said, gathering the 11 disciples at the top of the mountain, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." And the main idea of this passage, the main verb of this passage is simply the verb make disciples. And then it is reinforced with several other ideas, going, baptizing, and teaching. It was impossible for the 11 on that mountain to make disciples of all the nations if they stayed on that mountain. You and I would not be believers in Jesus Christ if they had stayed. Going was imperative. And then baptizing them, which is shorthand for preaching the gospel, uh, having them make a heart response to the gospel, and then a public profession of affiliation with Jesus Christ through baptism, followed by the next idea of teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So what was making disciples to look like according to Jesus in the Great Commission? Spreading out, preaching the gospel, and teaching them the content of the New Testament, and specifically teaching them to observe, not simply an informational download, but the truths of Scripture applied to life. That is what making disciples would look like from the Great Commission. It is a command, it's not a suggestion, 
And it is frankly what all of us as believers in Jesus Christ participate in. Those 11 disciples were to be disciple-making disciples who make disciples to the ends of the earth. And the way that happens from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to Tempe is if disciples become disciple-making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we're at the end of that chain. And hopefully that chain is not a cul-de-sac, but a conduit for the continuation of discipleship even to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age. What is a disciple? This is a common word in the New Testament. It simply means a learner. In Revelation 14, 3, there are those who learn a song. It is the the song that only the 144,000 marked out in Revelation 14 know, and they sing it. But it is a song that is learned. When we think about discipleship, we're not talking about learning a song. We're not talking about learning information. We are talking about learning a person. A disciple of Jesus was a learner of Jesus. The Pharisees had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. But to be a follower of Jesus is to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, belonging to Jesus, being one of his disciples, was to be a learner of Jesus that came with a cost. Self-denial, a death to self, a, a daily setting self aside in order to actually follow Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus means to learn, to follow, to imitate. And you need to know that every true Christian is a disciple of Jesus. Disciple is not some title for an elite Christian, some radical Christian, some serious Christian. It's not a synonym for apostle. One of the first generation specially commissioned ones given divine revelation from God to establish the foundation of the church for successive generations. No, a disciple is simply cross-generational follower of Jesus who's followed in the footsteps of others who have followed Jesus before. A disciple is not a pastor, not a leader. A disciple is just a Christian. And discipleship is the practice of being and reproducing followers of Jesus. To be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus. To make disciples is to make followers of Jesus. Discipleship is the process of introducing others to Christ and seeing them grow in Christ. This is a normal part of life in the church. In fact, you Christian are always to be in the flow of discipleship. You ought to be seeking to put your life in and around others who are following Christ better than you are. And you ought to be seeking to have your life be a conduit for Christ's life and others able to imitate your example as far as you follow Christ. We are always to be in the flow of discipleship. It ought to be the warp and woof of the church. It is the thing that goes through the culture of the church. It is the norm of the Christian life. By the way, that is contrary to the consumerist mindset of church that prevails in our day. That the job of people who come to church is to consume a product, to come and sit, be entertained, be helped, get some health help, self-help information to go about their day. That is not the New Testament model of the Christian life. That is not the New Testament model of the church, nor of church participation. You are a disciple, a learner of Jesus, being progressively conformed into the image of Jesus And you are lives on top of lives helping others to do the same. That is the culture of the church by God's design. Colossians 1.28 says that Christ is to be proclaimed so that every man would be complete in Christ. Down to the individual level, every Christian has as his or her aim conformity to Jesus who is the standard. In fact, in Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13, we we get the apex of what the standard is for Christian growth. And again, not growth for the Christian elites or the Christian radicals, but for all believers. Paul writes, 
The saints are to be equipped, that's all believers, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That is all of us individually, collectively joined until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The standard of Christian growth is not the Christians around us. The standard of Christian growth is Jesus. And we labor together in one another's lives to aim at that standard. We are to be conduits of Christ's life. So the 11 in Matthew 28 were commanded to go make disciples, to make disciples of all the nations. That is, they had to depart from the mountain. Uh, they had to proclaim Christ and they would do so in concentric circles outward from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost regions of the earth. Notice Jesus promised at the end of this great commission that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. This is the authority of Christ, the very presence of Christ, the commissioning of Christ that would transcend the lifetime of those original 11, which means it includes us. The age is not ended. The ends have not yet been reached. And Jesus has promised to be with us in this process. Part of the discipleship process in Matthew 18 is this idea of baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That baptism is shorthand uh, for being a Christian, which involves personal faith in Jesus Christ and an outward expression of that faith and loyalty, union with Christ and union with his people. Jesus here is not instructing his disciples just to baptize people, just go out and get everybody wet. No, how did the disciples themselves apply this? They preached the gospel, calling people to repent and believe, and they baptized them after they experienced regeneration by the Holy Spirit. And you can trace that history through the book of Acts. To make disciples by baptizing them means to be preaching the gospel indiscriminately to everyone everywhere. And whoever it is that God saves is to give public testimony to this through baptism. The New Testament, by the way, does not know of believers unbaptized. The, this carries the imperatival weight or the, the command flavor of the main verb. Uh, believers are to be baptized, giving public profession of their faith in Christ. And then Jesus says, you are to teach them. Again, teach them to observe all that I commanded Teaching them to observe, that, that is not just informational, it is personal. And, and because it's personal, that is the, the truths of the New Testament intersect personally with lives. That means this discipleship is individualized, customized obedience. Where the word of God interacts with the Christian life, there is to be increasing conformity to Christ. That is, putting off the things that don't please him and putting on the things that do. There is a transformation that happens as a process in the Christian life that is implicit in this command. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means to be a follower of Jesus, increasingly conformed to his way of living. What does it mean to make disciples? It means to go about in each other's lives seeking this same end. Listen, it means that discipleship and a discipleship culture in the church is necessarily intrusive. It's intrusive. We, it, it's personal. There will be personal questions, personal inventory. There will be examination of each other's lives as we seek to care for one another. It means people will talk about you or talk, talk about you. That would be unbiblical. Um, talk with you about things like marriage and parenting and very personal things. How is your fight with sin going? Hey, what are you praying about? What are the burdens of your soul? Who are you sharing the gospel with? Those kinds of things become very important and customized and personal and intrusive lines of conversation, and they are to be the norm in the Christian life. The church is to be a culture of discipleship, lives on lives, 
pressing for greater conformity to Christ at an individual level and a collective corporate witness level. This is what it means to be in the church. This is what it means to be a part of Christ, to be a part of his body. I'm going to put for you up on the screen a couple of charts. Uh, the first one is a flow chart of discipleship of men in the church. Okay, you probably can't read the fine print. That's okay. Uh, I have put these charts on the web notes so you can see them better. The, the bottom section is the largest sort of text bubble there. It represents all the men who come to Grace Bible Church, members and regular attenders. Um, how, how do they benefit from this discipleship culture at Grace Bible Church? Well, you're here on a Sunday morning. Uh, maybe you come to a quipping hour, and you should, Sunday night services. Uh, you're uh, you, perhaps involved in small groups. We would love for everyone at Grace Bible Church to be involved in the small groups, those midweek opportunities to be around each other and care for one another well, to ask each other some of these questions and, and to engage in this life-on-life -life discipleship. And then, of course, there are the non-programmed things. In, in the background of, of this sort of flow chart is the normal life of the church where we interact with each other. It's when you show up early for church and, and give timely encouragement to one another. It's, it's when, you know, we try to end an evening service at 7, sometimes 7.15, and it just keeps going and going and going, and you won't leave, and it takes till 9.30 to turn out the lights and close the doors because you're around each other and hanging out with each other, and you're exchanging life with each other. There's no bubble for that or program for that. It, it's when a, a phone call is made midweek, a timely email or encouragement is, is had, or the church just sort of gathers at Sagebrush Coffee. That's like the office east. And if you go in there anytime in a midweek, you're just going to run into people from Grace Bible Church. And there they are having spiritual conversation with one another. And nobody told them to do it. That is, that is a culture of discipleship that, that is happening and must happen. And must continue to grow and thrive and flourish. So that's all the men at the church. And we love to have all the men at the church participate in that next bubble, which is build. And, and that is the uh, biweekly during the school year program designed to help men cultivate spiritual disciplines and consistency. Leading, of course, with the consistency of, of putting your head and your heart under the faucet of God's word to meet with God. And then to allow that spiritual vitality of regularly coming to God and his word to flow out into your home. To flow out into those close relationships so that as you are a shepherd of your own soul, you become a shepherd of those close around you. And then that shepherding care spills out into other avenues, the church and outside the church. And cultivating those fundamental disciplines is, is part of the programmatic discipleship that the elders have put together for the men in this church. And, and men who do that well, men who are faithful in that, uh, can receive an invitation to a little bit more of a disciplined approach to things like hermeneutics. That is, how do we apply the, the, the rules of studying the Bible to actually looking at passages, um, to the study of systematic theology, and the guys in that group end up preaching sermons to each other at the end of the year. And then we have things like shepherdology, which is a more focused ministry talk for ministry leaders, elders and deacons and interns and prospective missionaries and seminary students. Off to the side there, you see BCEV training, Biblical Counseling of the East Valley. Uh, any of the men in the church can sign up to be trained uh, in counseling, specifically, how do I take the truths and principles of God's word and apply them to life's problems? And then there are small groups, and, and, and some are in small groups learning to lead small groups under a small group leader, and there is small group leader training. And, and then there is this uh, thing called the Expositor Seminary, men who are uh, experiencing a, a, an, an unquenchable desire for full-time ministry. And whose lives have been scrutinized and seen. And, and the elders of this church want to invest in them seminary training, which is learning original biblical language exegesis. You're learning Greek and Hebrew and learning to understand the Bible in its original languages. Systematic theology, church history, pastoral ministry, biblical counseling. 
And then above that, I don't know if it went off the top of the screen. Maybe the bubble's too big. Oh, there we go. Um, then there is this thing called an elder internship. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later this morning. Uh, we're going to invite a, a new intern into that process, a, a year long, and that's a flexible timescale process of a, of a man able to enter into eldering as something of a test drive. Um, and then the equipping still goes on. All of the men who serve as shepherds, elders, pastors, overseers at this church are still sheep and students and must still be equipped and trained, and they must still grow in their Christ likeness. They must still be discipled, even as they carry a task of discipling. All right, next slide. This is something of a, um, of a parallel. This is what does the discipleship culture look like for women at the church? Again, the, the bottom box there is all the women who call Grace Bible Church home, mem members and regular attenders. And the backdrop of all of this is that unstructured, unprogrammed culture of discipleship that must happen in the church. And then many of you women have participated in Wellspring. Again, cultivating spiritual disciplines in the life of the women of this church. Off to the right, you have other equipping opportunities. There is one-on-one -on -one mentoring you can sign up for, or women as well are invited to participate in BCEV, Biblical Training of the East Valley, learning to take biblical truths and sound doctrine applied to life's problems, uh, preventatively as well as in crisis mode. And then from Wellspring, women who do Wellspring um, and do that well can be invited to Digging Deeper, uh, which is a, a little bit more in-depth study of texts or books of the Bible, but with an aim to focus on the hermeneutics of how one studies. And then there are other discipleship ministries that women can be involved in. Uh, from Wellspring discussion group leaders to Wellspring kids leaders, next generation ministries, teachers and leaders, 414 leaders, small group discussion leaders in student ministries, keepers of the faith. There's mentoring groups, moms groups, small groups. There are lots of ways where women not only are receiving discipleship, but have avenues to then disciple others in the style of Titus 2, older women teaching younger women. And then there are uh, some women who will participate in teaching in women's ministries throughout the church. So I put those in front of you just to, just to let you know uh, some of the intentional planning behind discipleship in the church. And you might think for a moment that when there is a flow chart, it's something like a blueprint. You know, uh, one day the elders got together and said, let's draw up the blueprint and let's do that blueprint. And, and I wouldn't want to mislead you. That is not at all what has happened here. <laughs> The blueprint is react, or the, the flow chart is reactionary to what God and his kindness has done over time with elders scrambling to put in place biblical principles and say, how are we going to enact these principles? How will we go about putting these things in place in the local church? So those are there just to help you understand uh, the discipleship culture of the church is twofold. There is intentional discipleship, uh, programs, planned out things, and then there is the unintentional, the informal, the unplanned, the unscheduled kinds of discipleship in the church. Where do pastors, shepherds, elders, missionaries come from? Well, they ought to be homegrown. And at times, even if that is outsourced, and this church has benefited from that process as well, they were homegrown somewhere. And so disciples are made by evangelism and then by life-on-life -life discipleship processes, uh, bringing people in greater conformity to Christ. A culture of discipleship in the church is fertile soil for the growth, development, training of pastors, Christians making Christians, and Christians being made complete in Christ together. All right, now we'll switch gears. When we ask, where do pastors come from? Number one is a culture of discipleship in the church from Matthew 28. But secondly, second passage this morning comes from 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 
And when we ask the question, where do pastors come from? They come from pastors imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. Pastors must impart the sacred trust to reliable men. So look down at your Bibles at 2 Timothy 2, 2. Paul here tells Timothy, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy is one of the collection of New Testament letters that we call the pastoral letters. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul tells us what these letters are for. He essentially says, these are the instruction manual for how to do church. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, I'm writing these things to you, Timothy, so you will know how one is to conduct himself in the church, which is the household of faith and the pillar and support of the truth. So when we're reading 2 Timothy 2, we are reading what Paul has seen fit uh, by the superintending work of the Holy Spirit to instruct churches on how to do church. And one of the mandates of how to do church is that men must train future pastors. Uh, look again at what Paul says here. The things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Second Timothy as a letter serves as Paul's last instructions to Timothy, his protege. And it begins here with this sacred trust. What are the these things in Second Timothy 2.2? Well, in 2 Timothy 1, Paul repeats this same phrase, uh, the things you've heard from me. And he says there, retain the standard of sound words, which you heard from me in the faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, this treasure, which has been entrusted to you. Similarly, in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, we thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. What was Paul talking about when he said these things, Timothy? What is this sacred trust that must be entrusted to faithful men? In short, it is apostolic doctrine in the pages of the New Testament. They are the traditions that Paul taught, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. They are the practices he commended to all the churches, 1 Corinthians 14.37. They are the instructions that he gave in his letters that were to be read to all the churches, 1 Thessalonians 5.27. It is the New Testament. It is the truth of God in his word. By the way, this command that Timothy entrust these things, entrust New Testament doctrine to an, another generation of faithful men, is an implicit denial of apostolic succession. That's the idea throughout church history that, that you had the first generation apostles and they handed the baton to another generation of apostles. And Ephesians 2.20 makes it clear that the apostles and New Testament prophets are the foundation level of the church. The foundation isn't built on the second story, the third story, the fourth story, or in our case, now we're in the 21st floor. We want to call it that. The apostles themselves were foundational. They received direct revelation from the Lord. What was the command to Timothy? Not, Timothy, I'm handing you the mantle of apostleship. Now go get some more direct revelation from the Lord. No, Paul handed Timothy the New Testament and said, entrust this to faithful men. Entrust this truth, this doctrine, this revelation that God has already revealed. The future of the church would depend on the entrusting of truth to faithful men, generation after generation. You see, the church would not be able to go hire another Apostle Paul, nor install a new line of prophets to speak truth by direct revelation. Every successive generation of the church must train others to faithfully teach the truths given to the church in the first generation. What does Paul mean when he says here, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses? It means what Paul was handing to Timothy was not some secret knowledge Paul only had. It was widely known. Others could testify that this is what we all heard from Paul. There were those in Ephesus around whom Timothy did his ministry who claimed myths and legends and some sort of uh, mystery knowledge. 
And Paul said, that's not what you are to hand off. But that which is widely known, that which has been publicly proclaimed. And what does it mean here when Paul says to entrust them? It means to entrust for safekeeping. The same word is used in Acts 20 when Paul entrusted the Ephesian believers to the Lord. 1 Peter 4.19, suffering believers are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator. And in 1 Timothy 6, Timothy was to guard what had been entrusted to him, avoiding, avoiding worldliness and empty chatter. To entrust these things meant to give it to faithful men for safe keeping. So pastors are to impart the sacred trust to reliable men. The sacred trust is the truths of the New Testament doctrine and the revelation of God given through the apostolic witness. And the reliable men are described here, faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What does it mean to be a faithful man in this context? It means to be reliable, trustworthy. Your task as an elder, as a shepherd, as one entrusted the truths of the New Testament is to protect and to pass on the truth. To be faithful is to be worthy of belief or trust in, to be trustworthy, dependable, reliable. And notice the order here. Entrust these things, Paul says to Timothy, to faithful men. In other words, find faithful men and then entrust them with New Testament truth. You see, there are dangers in honing theology apart from maturity. Doctrine without faithfulness. Because bad men make good doctrine look bad. It's true that every Christian needs theology. But there is a danger in giving immature men theological categories, theological vocabulary, head knowledge, a sort of theological status where they get big words to bludgeon people with, big ideas to inflate their pride, a theological conversation and a library of information masquerading as maturity. An immature man can hide behind theology speak and be untouchable and unteachable. And we've seen this, older, wiser, godly men who can be intimidated by the theological conversations of young men with unbridled tongues, unrepentant sin patterns, and unrecognized arrogance. And a man who's been faithfully following Jesus for five decades can get around a young guy who just learned some big new theological words and parades around like a hotshot with those ideas. Oh man, I, I, I don't know those big words. And we forget what a faithful life of four, five, six decades following Jesus. We forget the value of that. We forget the benefit of that. And and sometimes we replace Christian maturity or the ideas of Christian maturity with simply the accruing, the very fast, quick, and immature accruing of a lot of information. And Paul says, entrust these things to faithful men. How do you see faithfulness? A Scantron, anybody remembers a Scantron exam? Fill out the little bubble circles with a number two pencil, put it in the machine. Yep, faithful. No, you, you, you see a faithfulness displayed by time and trials, a long obedience in the same direction, uh, to borrow another man's phrase. One pastor said, your theology will not always move you in the direction of obedience, Because your use of theology is governed by the condition of your heart. That's right. Spiritual maturity, uh, uh, an obedience to Christ from the heart, cultivated over time and through trials, is a faithfulness to which the truths of Scripture are to be entrusted for transmission to the next generation. This is critically important to the survivability of the church in Jesus' plan. It means the kind of men involved here are not men who leapfrog over their hearts nor leapfrog over their homes. They're not ones who skirt around the qualifications for spiritual leadership. And it also means for those training and cultivating shepherds that slow is good. Slow is good. First Timothy 5.22 says, Do not lay your hands on anyone too quickly, lest you share in their sins. It is important that those who aspire to spiritual leadership get ready for the long haul. And it's important that those who are in need of spiritual leadership don't pull the trigger too quickly. 
and cause harm to the church. Look, there's an expediency that says we need leaders now. It's better to go slow and to build quality leadership than to rush the process. How do we know if a man is faithful? How do we know if a a man is a kind of man who can be trusted to preserve and promulgate precious truth? We have to ask the question, what does he do with truth he receives? Is there a heart of love? 1 Timothy 1.5 tells us that the goal of the instruction that we have is love. And that love is uh, described as that which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Is there a love for Christ and a love for people? You're watching a man's life. Does increasing knowledge puff up his pride? Does he exercise wisdom in the application of truth to his own heart and life? Do the great and glorious truths of God humble him, or are they merely stimulation for intellectual curiosity? Does he confess his shortcomings as they are revealed by the word of God? Does he learn to avoid those truths that assault his sin and dwell only on the ideas that he can wield over others? Is there pride, avarice, self-serving ambition, or a lust for power? You're looking at young men, particularly if they view doctrine as a toy to be played with. An idea to to hold in the hand and, and turn it over like a Rubik's Cube and just see what it does. And show it off to others. Or is the truth in that man's life a precious commodity to be prized, protected, and passed on? The instruction is clear. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. There's a relationship between doctrine and character. As you trace the New Testament and you find those false teachers who have strayed from sound doctrine, there is always a connection to the heart and behavior. And listen, sometimes an an unbridled sinful tendency produces errant theology. That is... I really don't want to corral my lusts. And so I've got to shape my theology to let my flesh off the hook. And the theology changes in order to cover up the sins. And sometimes it goes the other way. Uh, At the heart of all sins is errant theology. And so someone decides for whatever reason to go off the rails theologically. Eventually, a corrupt life will follow. And there's a symbiotic relationship between those two. What does a faithful man look like? He must be faithful not to alter the message, faithful not to shrink back under persecution, faithful not to bow to external pressures, faithful not to give in to internal compromise, not fond of sordid gain, free from the love of money. He must be men of proven character, not given to selfish ambition, not quarrelsome. He must be self-controlled, not given to speculations or fruitless discussions. And faithfulness also means he must be faithful to pass on the truth. I've had the experience of of being in a ministry where a a man desired to do this very thing, to pass on what he knew to others. But eventually what the men in the church knew uh, closely approximated what he knew. And, and what was discovered was he actually liked being so far ahead of the other men in the church that when they knew their Bibles well, that was a threat to him personally. And, and he abandoned truth and he abandoned a faithful life and went after other things because he liked being the one who could tell guys things they didn't know. What does a faithful man do? Train all the men to know the Bible better than you do and not be threatened by it. That would be a win. That would be a glorious victory in Christ's church. You've played telephone game, no doubt. You know, you you get in a circle with friends and, and one person has a message and you whisper it to the next person and that person tells the next and the next and the next. And you see what the message is when it comes out the other end. That's kind of a fun and entertaining exercise. Some don't have a great ability to remember Others have difficulty hearing and and then being able to clearly articulate the message to the next participant. And then there's always that one guy, and, and maybe it's you, who intentionally garbles the message just to break the chain. Look, the same is true in the relay race of passing the baton from generation to generation 
the baton of New Testament truth down the generations of churches. Listen, there's not a church that was faithful 2,000 years ago that is still running the race with that same baton today. Churches have come and gone. Denominations have come and gone. Seminaries have risen and fallen. Holding on to truth is hard in this life, and yet it is the mandate for the church that its leaders pass on the sacred trust to faithful men. Listen, there are four generations on display here in 2 Timothy 2.2. The things that you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, entrust these things to faithful men, third generation, who will be able to teach others, fourth generation, also. And the implication of that is just keeps going and going and going until Christ comes back for his church. John MacArthur said it well, Timothy is the second runner in a long relay. And that's where we find ourselves as a church, running that same relay. Paul did not tell Timothy to hand over the reins of power to others, but to find men of good character who will be able to teach others the truth. And that lends itself to the character qualification that's required of elders, that's different than other levels of spiritual leadership in the truth or in the church, an elder must be able to teach. That doesn't mean that every elder will be in a pulpit regularly on a Sunday morning, but it does mean every elder, overseer, shepherd, pastor must be able to handle God's word in the lives of God's people with clarity and accuracy. It's one of the requirements. That's a pattern for the protection and transmission of apostolic doctrine of New Testament truth from one generation to the next for the life of the church. So how do you identify faithful men? Where can you find them? Again, is there an Amazon.com site we can go, faithful men, okay, we'll entrust them. Or can we get faithful men who have already been entrusted? Sometimes you inherit them, sometimes you hire them. But they are cultivated somewhere. And it is the church's mandate to be about that business all the time. That's a critical task of the church. Let's bring up again the chart of the flow chart of discipling men at the church. Again, this was not an original blueprint in the constitution of the church that the elders have followed. This represents the desperation of the elders at this church to what do we need to do next to help men grow in Christ and to faithfully serve and lead in this church. You see there, um, just under eldering, it's the second bubble from the top, this elder internship. This elder internship. Um, We're going to invite Ben James into an elder internship. And you've heard Ben Uh, You heard him lead our communion meditation this morning. If you're in a small group, you've heard him handling the word of God. If you've been close to him, you've seen his life. Uh, Ben and Melissa have been at Grace Bible Church since 2007. And their daughters, Emma and Karis, have been a vibrant part of this church as well. And it's just wonderful to have watched Ben serve and grow and serve And shepherd and lead and disciple and teach in so many facets of this church. Ways that we are aware of and many ways that we're not aware of. Pouring his life into others in in what is to be the normal stream of discipleship in any local church. Ben's been doing those things. Perhaps you've served with Ben or under Ben in Next Generation Ministries over the years. Perhaps you've been under his teaching in the small group and his teaching of others to teach in his small group. Ben has been a a sharp student and a theologian and a church historian, and he's been a shepherd of souls, his own soul, and that shepherding extended in his family. To enter into an elder internship at Grace Bible Church requires a, a life of demonstrable faithfulness on display over years. A consistency of life, not perfection. If Jesus were waiting for sinless elders, we'd never have a church. But a life on short accounts with God. uh, A life lived with consistent character. 
And so when we invite a man into the elder internship process at Grace Bible Church, it is done so through a significant uh, manner of examination. Uh, that is, we, we watch the man, uh, examine the man based on the character qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Uh, it would be helpful for us just to look at those. We won't give explanation here. We'll just read them. We'll look at the list in 1 Timothy 3, first of all, beginning in verse 1. And the list of qualifications begins with an aspiration, that is a desire to do the work of shepherding. Just notice, first of all, that's not a desire for the office or recognition or status. It is an aspiration unto the labor. Paul writes, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife or a one woman man, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, managing his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God and not a new convert? so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And in Titus 1, we get some not identical, but overlapping qualifications. Titus 1, 7 and 6. Beginning in verse 6. If any man is above reproach, a one-woman man, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not, of, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. An elder, and for us, a candidate for elder internship, must be qualified in these areas. Ben has undergone a, a formal examination process that involved... Melissa and their children involved all of the elders, and we were pleased to ask him to enter into what is essentially a year-long test driving of eldering. You see, not every godly man in the church should be an elder. Sometimes we can mistake the idea that if a man has a spiritual pulse, he needs to be a pastor, send him to seminary. That's not the idea. The church must be full of godly men who are not elders. And those who aspire to the labor must be above reproach in these areas of qualification. By the way, all those areas of qualification are required of every believer in the church. Uh, the ability to teach being the one exception, although we teach one another through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs on a weekly basis as well. But an elder has to be unimpeachable in his character. That is, no accusation be drawn against him in these areas. To invite a man for us into an elder internship means he sits with the elders at elder meetings, means he shepherds alongside of us. He has shepherding and oversight responsibilities in the church. And he is in one sense test driving his own season of life. Is, is this what I hoped it would be? I've aimed at eldering. I want to be qualified to be a man who could shepherd and lead and, and bear the burden of God's church. And an elder internship gives a man an opportunity to see, yeah, this really isn't for me. I want to be a godly man and I want to serve in other ways in the church. Or being on the front row of seeing what God is doing in his church is such a delight and such a joy and such an unparalleled privilege. I want to give my life to that. And bearing the burden and the weight of the care of souls for which I will be accountable before God is worth it. That is a matter of joy. 
that is an enterprise worth engaging my life in at cost, at great sacrifice. And I want to do those things. It gives a man a year to participate in ways he hasn't participated before. To, to know the elders who are serving in ways he hasn't known them before and to be known in ways he hasn't known before. It gives a man's family the opportunity to test. This is what we want to be about as a family. Uh, there is an engagement in the home in this marvelous task. You have a role in all of this as a church. What does it mean for you as a church to think about Ben James in an elder internship? Well, it means your task is to examine his life. There is a period of testing. Uh, there's a period of testing prescribed for prospective deacons, and there is a period of testing and demonstrable faithfulness to be seen in a prospective elder as well. So over the course of the next year, this is an open invitation for you to speak into Ben and Melissa's life, to come to the elders with questions, concerns, encouragements, joys, observations. Uh, it is an opportunity for you to engage with this process of training up, raising up, equipping, cultivating shepherds, both for the present and for the future. If you have any questions about this process, uh, please don't hesitate to ask any of the elders about this. Uh, we're thankful in advance for the ways that you will participate in this because we know how you've participated in this process in the past. And every one of the elders as a fellow sheep in this church benefits from the stream of discipleship that all of you bring into our own lives. We're thankful and anticipating that that will continue to the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to think about discipleship and to think about your Holy Spirit's making shepherds for the church and even the use of means to that end. We pray, O oh God, that we as a church would be a means that you use to raise up many shepherds, many elders, many missionaries, many church planters for decades to come. And we pray that the truth, the truth of your word, the purity of the gospel and fidelity to the New Testament would transcend this generation and would it transcend the walls of this building? Would it go beyond our time and beyond our place for your glory until you return? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.